Hi, everyone, to today's Applying Ethology webinar. Um, great to see so many people interested in the topic. Before we start with the webinar, just uh, as usual, two things that we need to make you aware of during the webinar, please uh, make sure that you switched off your microphone. Um, please also try to switch off your video just in case there might be any connection problems. Um, and after the webinar, if you have any questions for the speaker, um, please either raise your virtual hand, there's a small icon in Zoom, um, and you uh, will be named and you can you can ask your question in person, or if you prefer, you can also drop your question in the chat, either during the webinar or after the webinar, and the moderator will read out the question. Um, it's a great pleasure for us today to have uh, uh, one of the initiators of the Strange Framework presenting this topic today to, to this audience. Um, Christian Roots is a professor at University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He's generally interested in animal behavior and cognition, but also human evolution, uh, animal tracking technologies and conservation science. And together with Mike Webster, they initially proposed and uh, broadcasted uh, this strange framework, a framework to help researchers to identify and report sampling biases in studies of animal behavior. Today, he's going to uh, uh, provide this framework in the context of studying and improving animal welfare. And without further ado, I'm handing over to Christian for the presentation. Thank you very much, Christian, for, for the introduction. And uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to speak. Uh, this is a great uh, seminar series, and uh, it's a real pleasure to explain to you today uh, the idea of the, the strange framework, and specifically how it can be used uh, to study animal welfare and improve animal welfare more generally, even in cases where it's not the focus of the research itself. Uh, before I start, I want to um, uh, say thank you to uh, some colleagues, uh, Mike Webster, with whom I started the journey, as Christian just mentioned. We've got a, a little core team that is currently running the strange initiative uh, that includes Kat, Alice, and Julia has been looking after our Twitter account. Um, there is um, a, a sub working group of a uh, cost action that looks specifically at the potential utility of strange for aiding research on positive animal welfare. I would like to say thank you to Matteo, Isabel, and Elodie for their help with that and for the, the broader cost action work, Linda and Laura. But now I want to introduce you to the framework itself. The framework was designed to help animal behavior researchers identify, mitigate, and report sampling biases. It applies to all taxa, both vertebrate and invertebrate, and all study types, so lab and field, experimental and observational. It was specifically designed to support established guidelines, including the three R's and ARRIVE, so it avoids duplication, and I will explain later uh, how exactly that is achieved. And it was inspired by the highly successful WEIRD concept in human experimental psychology many of you will be familiar with. And it provides a really convenient memory aid, at least it helps me. I constantly ask myself, how strange are my study animals? That'll make more sense in a second once I've explained what the acronym actually stands for. Researchers collect data usually for samples of animal subjects. We don't have the capacity and we shouldn't study whole populations, but we draw samples and then use these samples uh, usually to draw inferences about the wider population. So in this hypothetical example, I collected data for three of these uh, crows to make inferences about the larger population. But the problem is that samples are very often severely 
biased, for example, with regards to sex, age, experience, condition or personality in this mock example here, I ended up taking measurements for three orange phenotypes, even though orange is the rarer phenotype in the larger population. Most of these hypothetical crows are of the gray phenotype. So I just ended up with a non-representative sample. This bias sample composition can impact the interpretation of results, limit the generalizability of my findings, complicate comparisons between studies, and ultimately hamper reproducibility. When Mike and I started talking to colleagues about this, uh, it actually turns out that this is very well known within the research community, but it's largely ignored. Strange tries to address this problem head on. The acronym STRANGE uh, has seven letters, and I will unpack that for you. Uh, when Mike and I started thinking about potential um, uh, sampling bias, we, we thought it's helpful to think about how animal behavior actually comes about. And we could think of three main foundational pillars. First of all, what matters is the animal's genetic makeup or genetic background. Uh, then the social influences it's experienced, uh, that includes social learning. And then individual level experience, that includes trial and error learning. If you take these three, you can explain an awful lot of um, animal behavior. And we then filled in some gaps using uh, some factors that are actually well known to influence variation in animal behavior and that can be associated with severe sampling biases and studies of animal behavior. So this is the, the full acronym unpacked for you. Social background, trappability and self-selection, rearing history, acclimation and habituation, natural changes and responsiveness, genetic makeup and experience. I know that this is not the most memorable uh, acronym, but uh, I will explain to you later what these different levels mean. There is some intentional overlap between uh, these different factors, um, and I will explain that too. So this is strange. It's important to note that these seven factors are not in themselves problematic. In fact, they are very often the focus of very well-designed uh, research projects, or they are confounds that are specifically controlled for. For example, in the statistical analyses, uh, we may control for the effect of sex, and then there is no case to answer. But concerns arise whenever test samples are biased and researchers do not account for this bias. And I would argue that there is very significant scope for sampling biases in animal research in general and animal behavior and animal welfare research in particular. And I've given some examples here that ranges really from standard uh, laboratory models um, to uh, work in the wild. Uh, here's a sea turtle fitted with a biologging tag. Uh, there are very often very significant sampling biases and tracking studies. I want to give you um, a couple of examples to explain what exactly we mean by these seven factors. And it's important to note at the outset that the studies I highlight here, they actually set out to illustrate um, these effects. So they, they didn't um, uh, trap into um, a, a strange pitfall or anything. They, they were well-designed studies that were looking to demonstrate these effects. Um, the first one is one of my, my favorites to, to explain uh, the strange framework. This study um, was a lab-based investigation of uh, capuchin monkeys' um, behavior. They used uh, puzzle boxes, which they gave to the monkeys. And they found uh, that monkeys uh, that are less assertive and more open as measured on a 
behavioral or personality type scale were more likely to participate in experiments. So this was a very common um, testing paradigm, a self-selection paradigm, where the monkeys could choose whether or not to engage with the setup. And it turns out that the ones that do engage have a different personality than those that don't. And I think this is likely to be a very common problem in animal behavior studies. This would fall under the T of strange trappability and self-selection. Trappability is something that refers um, to um, something we usually have with uh, field work. If we have to trap subjects, some subjects are uh, often more easy to trap than others. That could also be related to their personality type, or it could be related, for example, to their physiological needs. Perhaps we get the hungry ones. This is another example, this time uh, one on fish. This is for guppies, where the researchers uh, compared domestic stock and feral subjects. And they found that fish from domestic stock swim further than feral subjects, and activity declines with acclimation. So we have two things going on here. First of all, it matters where our test subjects come from, domestic versus uh, feral. And it matters when we test them. So this is the G for genetic makeup and A for acclimation and habituation. And interestingly, the A, the acclimation or habituation, um, applies both for our domestic and our feral subjects. And finally, um, an invertebrate example, a study that found that flies that experience mating or are tested in the light rather than in dark conditions are more social and aggregate more closely. Another example where we actually have two factors of strange experience. So in this case, the experience of having mated and natural changes and responsiveness, in this case, in response to light conditions. So as I said, these studies set out to demonstrate this effect, but imagine uh, you run a study and uh, you don't consider them. Imagine you don't consider the fact that some of your subjects uh, that um, participate in your experiment and self-select uh, to participate in your experiment may be of a different personality type. Or you don't consider the fact where your test subjects are coming from, which genetic uh, line they are sourced from, or what prior experience they had. This is precisely what the strange framework tries to address. We had a really enthusiastic response to the proposal of uh, the strange framework, uh, and we're delighted that a couple of years ago, this was formally adopted as an initiative of the UK Reproducibility Network. We also had a significant interest and support from various other networks and organizations, including um, the UKRI um, Research Councils um, in the UK, the Royal Society of Biology, who hosted a meeting on this. Uh, ASAP um, ran two events uh, so far specifically focused on strange, um, a science cafe and a satellite meeting at one of its conferences. Uh, the International Society for Applied Ethology um, recently ran a workshop dedicated to strange, and we had also some really exciting activities with the Animal Behavior Life Network. There are also um, uh, research consortia um, that have shown interest in this, including the Chicken Stress Consortium and the Cost Action Lift, I had already mentioned, Lifting Farm Animal Lives. Uh, they are currently um, working on integrating Strange into their best practice protocols. There's also journals um, who got behind this very quickly. Some of them are specialist journals in animal behavior research. Then there are some broader interest journals like Journal of Experimental Biology and some really um, cross-disciplinary journals like eLife and PLOS Biology. Um, and they have integrated 
strange recommendations into their author guide guidelines and ask their authors of accepted manuscripts um, to use the guidance to make declarations and discuss the impact of potential sampling biases. Strange was originally conceived as a tool to be used in animal behavior and cognition research. This is my background and it's Mike Webster's background, but almost uh, within 48 hours of publication, other uh, people, colleagues from other disciplines told us how it applies to their uh, research fields. Um, there is now significant interest uh, from the animal welfare research community, which is today's topic. Um, people who work in conservation biology and ecology look into the relevance of strange for their work, immunology and physiology, medical and translational research, um, which very often uses uh, rodent uh, model systems. Um, they, they are interested in strange veterinary science, um, laboratory research and zoo biology and other fields, believe it or not, um, some people are thinking of adapting the strange framework for research on plants. So it's really broad in, in scope. And I want to briefly explain how we think strange will improve research reproducibility. It's important to note that with any such intervention, only time will tell if the intervention will be successful. But this is the pipeline we envisage for um, pushing for positive change in this area. And it illustrates how different stakeholders have to come together uh, to collaborate on, on this work. First of all, uh, the journey starts with usually with researchers or practitioners, and we would encourage them to consider strange related sampling biases when designing new studies and preparing grant proposals for potential funding. Funders have an important role to play in that they evaluate uh, our proposals and we suggest they should evaluate the potential significance of strange related sampling biases for the proposed objectives. Very often, even before a single data point has been collected, a uh, scope for sampling biases can be identified. And so we see a role for funders and their reviewers here. When a piece of research has been completed and is being written up for publication, Publishers um, can do their part um, by encouraging that authors report research and full compliance with the strange guidelines. I will explain how that can be done. We hope that this pipeline, this uh, collaborative interaction will lead to better research, enhance transparency, and ultimately improved reproducibility. So how... Uh, can we use strange in practice? Um, we came up with uh, what we call the 3D approach, design, declare, discuss. So at the design stage, uh, as you try and uh, uh, develop ideas and experimental protocols and analysis protocols for a new study, we encourage you to evaluate the importance of the seven strange factors for your study. Where necessary um, and where appropriate, um, it would be good to diversify the sample of subjects to make the sample more representative. I gave an example earlier on that uh, sometimes studies end up with a severely sex biased sample where predominantly males or females are being tested. Where this is relevant and possible, it may be good to, to try and achieve uh, parity in the sample. Another good example uh, includes personality. If the personality of the test subjects is known, it would be good to draw one that is representative of the, the larger population. Where necessary, um, it would be good to uh, adjust design and experimental procedures to reduce biases. I will give you an example of that. Um, quite often we follow what 
at least my generation learned as the gold standard of trying to experimentally control and standardize everything in our testing procedures. So for example, if we say habituation time for engagement with a new experimental task is one and a half hours, if a subject takes one and a half hours and one minute, it's excluded from the test sample. We argue that that is actually uh, not a good approach. We think it makes sense to relax those um, standardizations and, for example, allow the this, this subject the extra minute if that means it can participate. Of course, that needs to be uh, considered carefully in downstream analyses and it needs to be declared. But we think in general it's good to uh, be flexible with testing protocols to enable fuller participation. And it's really uh, good, I think, to document uh, these considerations and applications for external funding and ethical approval. Declare, uh, this is where we move on to a study that um, has been completed and is being written up for publication. And we think it's really crucial to provide information on subject attributes. So that's sex, age, experience, personality type, and so on, and the testing protocols. And this is important for both the final sample of subjects that yield data that are being used in the analyses, as well as all the excluded subjects. From personal experience uh, and from talking to many colleagues, very often the sample that produces valid data for statistical analysis is much smaller than the original test sample. But in our papers, we usually only talk about uh, those animals that engaged, participated, and yielded valid data. We argue that we urgently must move to a research practice where we report the attributes of those excluded subjects. In the example with the capuchin monkeys, for example, um, that would mean we would declare that we have only tested one particular personality type, but inadvertently excluded another. We also think that in papers, uh, it's important to evaluate scope for sampling biases more generally and describe any mitigation efforts, such as extending habituation time or testing time for some subjects. And then in the discussion section, we think it's important to discuss how sampling biases may limit the generalizability of findings. Um, our observation is that quite often, um, especially in the titles of research articles and in their abstracts, we very significantly overreach with our generalization. We talk about a species or um, a study population, whilst in fact we may have drawn our inferences from a severely biased subset. And in some cases, it may be more appropriate to say these findings apply, apply to females of this population of this personality type. So, as I mentioned, the first D of the three Ds, design, applies to the, to the study design phase um, in full compatibility with the three Rs. I will explain in a second how the second and the third D, declare and discuss, apply to the reporting phase in full compatibility with the ARRIVE guide. research on animal welfare, and specifically through the establishment and the use of robust behavioral indicator metrics. When we study animal welfare, we need indicators. Um, it is very obvious how this work can be affected by the sampling biases I had outlined earlier. But then the second um, uh, way is by improving animal welfare itself. Um, even when that is not the particular focus of uh, a research project. 
And we achieve that through refinement and reduction. In a nutshell, if we follow the strange guidelines and improve our experimental designs and our interpretation, there will be less noise in the behavioral data we collect. Uh, we can reduce the amount of exploratory research we require. And importantly, there will be much fewer failed replication attempts. All of this will benefit animals. On the reporting phase, strange complements arrive by requesting refined attribute data. I gave as an example personality types. Importantly, attribute data for excluded subjects, those that were in the original sample but then didn't make the cut for a variety of reasons because they didn't engage or they needed longer to engage and so on. And discussion of constraints on generalizability. Um, I don't expect you to, to read this, but I wanted to give one um, slide on illustrating how authors have started using the STRANGE guidelines, uh, including at many journals where STRANGE is not yet part of the author guidelines. So you see over a dozen different journals here, different teams uh, using the, the guidelines to uh, make declarations and hone their discussion. And I highlighted in yellow some keywords, which I think give you a good flavor for what that engagement looks like. So people talk about how representative their samples might be. They make assessments um, and say, well, we think um, that uh, uh, some effects are um, unlikely uh, sampling uh, biases, um, or they say they, they couldn't identify uh, any obvious sources of potential bias. That is absolutely fine. So strange, uh, as I will explain later, as a very light touch approach uh, to this kind of work. And it's perfectly okay to have a nil return in a paper and say, there is no case to answer. You know, this is, um, there, there were to the best of our knowledge, no sampling biases that need declaring. Then there are other cases where people actually say, well, you know, our subjects were actually heavily pre-selected and did not represent, you know, the behavior of the, the wider species, um, or they acknowledge specific selection biases. Um, they indicate that subjects had previously participated. Um, here's some more examples. These authors talk about um, unrepresentative uh, behavior, unintentional behavioral selection. Um, they talk about the strangeness of the, the population and they declare that methods and the amount of training varied. This is really important. Strange does not use um, a prescriptive formula. It doesn't even have a checklist. Um, the whole idea of this framework is built on the idea of empowering um, authors, researchers to make the declarations they think are right for their study. And this takes really varied forms. Uh, this is in-text examples, but some authors also provide information and supplementary information, for example, supplementary tables such as subject attribute data for subjects that um, uh, contributed data and those that didn't. I want to conclude by um, talking through the seven factors of strange with a specific example. And uh, although I study birds uh, myself, we, we study tool using crows. I, I don't study uh, chickens, but I thought they they would be a good example to go through, uh, through strange uh, with you together. So just as a reminder, these are the, the seven factors and we will go one by one and I will give some indicative questions you may want to ask if you were to work on uh, welfare in chickens. This is uh, leaning heavily on table S1 from our original paper. So if you find this exercise and these questions useful, please have a look at the supplementary table. Um, this is not part of the, the PDF as you download it, you have to download it separately. Uh, we have a very long table there with um, uh, guiding questions you may find helpful. 
So um, very specific example, chickens. Um, we may want to ask uh, what the social rank is of, of our subject uh, and whether this could affect participation in experiments. Chickens have pecking orders. This could affect um, participation. Are subjects housed alone or in groups? And if in groups of what size? Um, there is good evidence that this matters. Are subjects tested alone or in the presence of other animals? And are testing conditions adapted for non-participating subjects? That's what I had flagged earlier. Do we give those chickens that don't engage within the standardized uh, trial time, do we give them a little bit of extra time? Why not? What social experiences did subjects have prior to testing in terms of aggression, courtship, mating, and so on? So these are all questions we would cluster under S for social background. But as I had mentioned earlier, you will see that there is actually overlap between the seven factors, and that is intentional. The second one is on trappability and self-selection. And as I understand it, speaking to colleagues who do actually study chicken, uh, welfare, both of these apply. If subjects are trapped for testing, could this introduce sampling bias? For example, by researchers inadvertently targeting slower or more stress-tolerant stress birds. If a self-selecting experimental design is used, do all potential subjects participate? And what are the attributes of the non-participating subjects? If you have large numbers not participating, I would be very interested to know if there is something special about them. Can you rule out systematic bias and participation, for example, by social rank or personality type? And are test conditions adjusted to allow participation of otherwise excluded subjects, for example, by amending the setup or testing environment? Now we are on letter R for rearing history, and there is for some overlap with, uh, for example, S for social background. How were subjects socialized during their rearing period? And to what extent are subjects habituated to humans and the testing environments? To what extent have subjects experienced physical enrichment? And if housed in groups, to what extent are they similar in size and composition to the groups these animals live in under actual farming conditions. I think this is quite an important one. We uh, quite often in a welfare and pure animal behavior research context, uh, test our subjects in conditions that uh, are very different from those for which we like to draw inferences. Uh, so, for example, with with animal uh, with with chickens uh, in an animal welfare testing paradigm, you may test them individually or in very small groups. Yet, you try to make inferences about the behavior in large flock sizes. At this point, you may say, "Well, these are things I normally uh, describe in the method section of of papers." We found that quite often these issues are not described, even in very well-crafted uh, papers. And so this is why we suggest that uh, people go through the seven factors of strange as they write up their work. Now we are on A, acclimation and habituation. Could the behavior of subjects be affected by the presence of a human observer? Could the behavior of subjects be affected by the presence of experimental equipment? Uh, do subjects have sufficient time to acclimate to experimental conditions and is acclimation time standardized? And do all subjects acclimate to, to, acclimate to experimental conditions at the same rate? N, natural changes in responsiveness. So here we consider um, environmental factors, physiological drivers, and so on. Are chickens known to exhibit dial or seasonal variation in behavior? If so, when we test really matters. And if we don't describe that in our papers, that will affect um, the generalizability of our findings. Is the timing of experiments standardized to account for possible effects due to time of day, photo period, or season? Are all subjects of the same developmental stage, age and reproductive state? If not, how may this affect the behaviors observed? 
I just at this point, before we do um, the last two letters, want to remind you that you can ask these questions as you're thinking about new studies, new experimental designs, but you can also use these questions to interrogate completed work as you write it up for publication. So that's the design and the declare and discuss of the 3D approach. What about the genetic makeup? Is the test sample of subjects sex bias? Are we only testing males or females? Are the subjects from a specific breed? If so, that should be acknowledged in publications. Um, is the breed chosen suitable for examining the behavior of interest? And are inferences explicitly linked to the breed or study population investigated? This is quite important, and this is something I learned from talking to uh, many colleagues who work specifically on animal welfare, that sometimes uh, the work is conducted on one particular breed or line, but then uh, inferences are sought for a much larger set of breeds or genetic lines. We need to be quite careful with that, I think. And finally, E, which completes the strange acronym. This is experience. By this, we mean individual level experience rather than social experience. Have subjects participated in similar early experiments that may affect test performance? Uh, this is a very common problem in animal behavior research in general, where we may have captive populations where subjects are repeatedly tested. And quite often in our papers, we don't say what prior testing experience our subjects had, um, but it's easy to see why that matters and how there could be carryover effects from experiment to experiment. Have subjects participated in different experiments that may affect test performance? They may have learned something by being tested earlier, by being exposed to similar experimental setups. Have subjects experienced husbandry procedures that may affect their behavior or have they had previous opportunities to learn that may um, overshadow learning in the present study? All of these are really important considerations, I believe. I want to conclude by uh, drawing your attention to this cost action I had mentioned earlier, lift, lifting farm animal lives, uh, laying the foundations for positive animal welfare. This um, really large consortium has uh, in one of its working groups a sub working group that is specifically working on strange. Uh, so if you're interested in the application of strange to animal questions in, in animal welfare, uh, please consider reaching out to, to that consortium. I want to uh, wrap up with a couple of take home messages. First of all, uh, strange applies across a wide range of disciplines. And I mentioned that it applies across taxa and study contexts as well. Strange can improve research on animal welfare and it can improve animal welfare itself. Strange is pragmatic and light touch. Uh, no checklist, no uh, guidance that forces you to, to do something. We want researchers to engage with these considerations in a way that suits them and suits their work. And the response from the community so far indicates that that approach is working really well. People are very innovative in how they use Strange uh, for their work. Strange is easy to implement. Uh, that's our design, declare, discuss approach. And it's also a really good engine for generating interesting new questions. We found that in many conversations in our labs and collaborating labs, it's really fun to interrogate the spark of a new idea for a new project with Strange and think about how Strange may matter. And you will realize very quickly that rather than being a nuisance or a hindrance, it helps you to focus your study you set out to do. And very often it allows you to identify uh, plenty of ideas for other studies you could do. Um, Strange has sparked a really exciting grassroots push for positive change. And Strange needs your support. If you see value in, in this framework, uh, please consider reaching out, getting in touch. We love uh, discussing anything strange with you. Um, and we are also 
uh, continuing to to build our team that uh, tries to develop this into a larger movement that tries to improve how we do and report our research. I will stop here and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for this extremely clear and very interesting presentation of the Strange Framework and how it relates to animal welfare. We are open for questions. Uh, first ones are already popping in, so I'm just reading them out loud for those who do not follow the chat. Uh, Steen uh, is writing, thanks a lot for this interesting talk in observational studies on commercial farms. Does the participation of the farmer fall under self-selection and how would you acknowledge this bias in the paper? Um, just to make sure I, I understand this right. So the, the scenario envisaged is that we select a farm where we do the, the research and uh, the question is whether that that is a concern um that that process of selection i don't yeah that, that's that's a good point i i think um um it's it's not really self selection but i i would uh group it there i mean it's how we construct our our sample and uh, uh but this is a, a really good example of how it it could matter in an animal welfare research context uh quite often you know with limiting resources we we can only work in one location using one population and that needs to needs to be declared and we should think you know how likely it is that our findings from this one farm generalize to other farms and you know if this is a very standardized setup that is used uh, across many different farms perhaps generalizability is good but if there are idiosyncratic practices in this one location then generalizability may be limited and that should be discussed i think thanks Christian. um no further questions for now on the chat. So I have one that probably many audiences are going to ask you. And you, you mentioned that the um, the 3D approach, design, uh, declare, and discuss. Um, in animal welfare research, we often, due to logistical reasons, uh, research facility reasons, we often have access to a specific cohort of animals. So single breeds, or often single breeds, animals of a certain age. Um, and this, of course, limits the inferences that we can make. And of course, we can discuss these and also acknowledge these limitations. But of course, we would like to be able to make broader inferences about the results that we get. So from all the seven strange parameters, in your experience uh, that covers mostly wild animals, what are the the easiest or the, not the easiest, but the most efficient to tackle if you want to mitigate one of these aspects? Well, I, I think there there's a lot of uh, context specificity. I think it'll vary from study system to, to study system, but usually with most study systems, there are some really low hanging fruits. So I mentioned the um, with subject attributes, uh, quite often we have sex bias samples. In some cases, that's intentional um, because that is the the rearing practice where we only rear one one sex of the animal. In others, it's it's not, and where it's not, we it'll be very easy to to get a balanced sample. Um, I understand the the challenge of having these cohorts of animals that will accumulate experience over time, and. I don't uh, propose that we use naive animals for for everything we do. That would be counter to to what you set out to do. You know, you, it would be counter to the principles of the the three R's. But I think in those cases, what is important is to document the prior experience and declare that. And uh, I know that in a pure animal behavior research context many of our study subjects are very long lived and uh, perhaps we haven't kept the records we should have 10 years ago. So um, chimpanzees spring to mind. There are um, uh, laboratory groups of chimpanzees that have been participating in experiments for a very long time and we don't have the information. 
doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Start now. Like even if you wish you had documented this behavior in the past and you haven't, it's no problem. And this is something we always say. Strange is not intended as a policing tool to call out bad research. Um, nobody will blame you for not having written down, you know, prior experiments. But I think we need to collectively as a community push in a direction where it just becomes part of best practice. Um, but yeah, I going back to your question, like what is what is the easiest target? I think it it varies across system, but you will find that if you go through the list, you will very quickly find two or three things you you can rectify. Thanks, Christian. Um, there's still time to, to put your questions in the chat. Uh, I'm just continuing with some of mine. Um, in the meanwhile, I would stumble a little bit on the, the aspects that you mentioned for uh, the benefits for animal welfare, not for animal welfare research, but for animal welfare. No, no, I'm mixing this up. You mentioned that it's, it will reduce noise in your data. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on this? Because I, I might have missed that point how this happens exactly so this is simply by by uh honing our experimental testing protocols like if you clearly describe the um uh, and account for the attributes of your your subjects in your test sample um then you can take can take this into account the important thing is if um if you don't consider your subject attributes and aspects of your testing protocols and you don't report them in your, your publications, you will have others um, uh, who will run similar work, who will try to faithfully replicate what, what you are doing and can't because they are missing key information. So, um, you know, as a, as a simple example, if you test only males and somebody else has a mixed sex sample and they don't find what, what you find, uh, we we all get very nervous about a failed replication attempt, um, and we try to understand why. But if it's not documented in the paper, we we don't stand a chance. Um, and I would yeah I would argue that uh, you know we can significantly cut down these these misunderstandings. And for every individual study, if we carefully consider what our sample is, what it is we are testing. I think we can drive down a lot of the variation. So, for example, if your um, if your uh, objective is to test one particular personality type, um, well, select that personality type, declare it, and don't test your diverse sample. If your objective is to test, you know, the whole population, um, test the whole population and declare it. Thanks. Sir. So my misunderstanding was that I was focusing more on the, on the design part and not on the declare part. This makes perfect sense. Um, there are no more questions in the chat, which is just another evidence or even more evidence for the for the clear structured talk. <laughs> so um, I assume many more questions will pop up uh, either in your inbox from the audience. Um, there is another one, so I'm not wrapping this up yet. Uh, Samir is, is pointing out, thanks for the great talk. I believe this is a useful framework, but how would you account for and illustrate behavior differences between the tested population and the wider population? For instance, I'm thinking about in the zoo context where many animals are both genetically and behaviorally adapted to the environment. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is a real challenge. Um, and uh, But one we can make progress with, with proper declarations. So if you know that your zoo popul population most likely um, genetically and otherwise isn't representative of, of wild populations, that should be clearly stated in the paper and why, why you think that is the case. In other study contexts, we may actually stand a chance of uh, uh, tackling this issue. So I mentioned self-selecting experimental paradigms where some of our subjects participate, others don't. And I uh, encourage everybody to think about whether it's possible to get data from the non-engaging subjects um, by giving them more time or redesigning uh, the task or perhaps allowing them to participate in the presence of a social uh, partner that is important to them. This would give you 
actually uh, data for two samples, your self-selected sample and the initially uh, non-participating uh, sample. And you can look at how different their behavioral performance is. Um, it may turn out that actually in terms of the behavioral engagement, uh, um, they are very similar. They just needed a little bit of extra time. Or you may find striking differences. And this is a good example of how I think Strange can lead to, to some really exciting uh, follow-on research. Uh, in the work my group is doing on, on tool using crows, we, we are getting increasingly interested in those crows that don't participate. And uh, we try to to uh, set things up for them so that they will participate. And uh, I think that's a really exciting research avenue, but sometimes you can't and uh, and that's okay. And that's also what Strange tries to help with. It's okay to make uh, an honest statement in a paper and say, well, that's the limits of our study. Not sure how well it generalizes. That is much better than overreaching, claiming generalizability, and sending our peers on on a wrong path and and having to grapple with failed replications. I think this was a perfect last sentence for the webinar. Mm -hmm. um, there are no no more questions in the chat. Um, I'm sure, just continuing what I said, that you will probably receive a lot of rare related questions on the strange framework in your inbox, and or the lift subworking group and. Uh, yeah, I'm looking very much forward how this develops, how this implementation is moving forward and what will be the result of the subworking group and lift and in general. So thanks again, Christian, for your talk. Thanks again for joining us today. And thanks for uh, having me. Thanks, thanks to the audience for, for joining us to this uh, very interesting topic. Thanks, everybody. Hopefully seeing many of you uh, in the next webinar in two weeks. Bye bye. Bye bye.